Matthew Conan, congratulations on meal tickets. Thank you very much, Jim. This uh, remarkable film about what could have been a great band. How would you describe meal tickets in a nutshell, given that you spent how long making it? I'd say 12 years, okay. Jim. 12 years. I'd From... say it's, it's a coming-of-age bromance tale. Um, that looks at the life of chasing your dreams, your rock and roll dreams. How much footage did you shoot? What was the process of distilling it down to 90 minutes like? Was it torture? Was it easy? (laughs) It was a roller coaster ride, an absolute roller coaster ride. Um, Between, so I started shooting stuff in high school. Um, I played in a band with a few of these guys, and we also all made skate videos together. So there was a bit of footage from, from our early days, but mm-hmm. I primarily started shooting in 2004, and the real crux of this film, the story began in 2005. So um, I ended up fini- filming until about 2013, 2014, and by the end of it, I'd accumulated about 700 hours of footage. Yeah. Okay, so what were the key decision-making principles that guided your culling of the footage? All right, so my, my first step was to make a edit of the USA or bus tour. So in 2005, um, the, the, the film starts with us going on a, a crazy 30-day tour throughout the United States. And I shot about 100 hours of footage on that tour. And so in 2011, 2012, I cut that tour about 110 minutes and uh, had a screening. And it, it was a hoot. It was a great film. Um, I got a lot of laughs out of it. Uh, but the idea was kind of I used that as a fundraiser to get me to Los Angeles to continue filming the third act of the film. So having that at 110 minutes then allowed me to eventually cull it down to what's now about 16 minutes in the first act of the film. Right. So it started with that, and then I just kind of kept shaping away at the various different chapters okay. of the film. Okay. So just in brief, the film is about a band called the Screw Top Detonators. Correct. And you thought way back when that they were going to be huge. Um, I don't know if I thought they were going to be huge. I just thought that they had they they were a band that had a lot of opportunity, and right. the the chemistry was there um, where they were going to be taken on this wild ride. Did Sorry. you have like a vision for what the film was going to be, and the difference between that? And what you ended up with? The film's pretty spot on close to what I thought, uh, what I set out to make in Which 2005. Which was? Well, <laughs> for lack of a better description, Dig 2. I went to see Dig in 2005 just mm-hmm. before we saw this. And that film had a profound effect on me. Um, just the, the ambition that Andy Timono had when she set out to make that in the time span. I thought, I'm completely willing to throw myself into that to make a film mm-hmm. that might have a similar kind of cultural significance. And the basic arc of the film is that they worked hard with what appeared to be a good, hard-driving manager and had opportunities that they did not make wise decisions about. It almost appears to be like a warning or a cautionary tale. If you're going to go into the business, this is what not to do. Not necessarily. I mean, the hard thing, Jim, is that there is no formula to rock and roll. As Pip, the, the, the Irish tour manager, said, there is no guidebook to rock and roll. And I think some people watch this film and think that the screw tops did great and they stuck by their guns and they, um, you know, they stuck by their values and they didn't conform to a lot of the things Dave said and they, they, they remained authentic and they can hold their heads up high. Okay. Whereas for a lot of other people, I mean, Will, who's the, the other kind of character in the film, he had to kind of invent a, a sub-personality, if you like, to become the musician he wanted to be. So, you know, authenticity within musicians is a, is a tricky thing. Right. But the screw top stuck to their gun, and I have a lot of respect to them for, okay. them for that. Even though they're a pretty sizable opportunities that they knew they were missing out on in order for them to continue on what they thought was their vision. For instance, they had an opportunity to put out an album with a top producer, but because they fired their manager... With that, with that deal, yeah, that's a huge sacrifice. Yeah, it's, it is a huge sacrifice. I mean, they they just couldn't continue working with Dave Kavanagh, and a lot of perks came with remaining with Dave, um, and the label and putting out that record was one. So that was something that um, I guess an opportunity missed because now, they they couldn't continue with Dave. I just need, need to just quickly cover this because I think it's important because. They're all there. Their faces are up there on screen. Sometimes they look good. Sometimes they don't look so good. 
what arrangement did you come with the members of the band and with the manager, Dave Kavanagh, in order to complete this film? Do you have a, 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 an arrangement with them? Did you get them to sign releases? What's, what's the deal there? Because, I mean, frankly, if I was one of the members of the band, I'd, I'd be very worried about some of the stuff that's up on screen. Yeah. Hey, I'm not going to lie. I was having a deep and meaningful conversation with Charlie as I was driving to this interview about what's what's been going on, because I guess we didn't expect uh, Myth to happen so suddenly. And so now it's kind of been um, thrust upon everybody. And um, yeah, I guess, look, we everybody kind of signed off on it a while ago. It, I didn't have them sign release forms in the early stages because... I I wanted them to remain comfortable. Like we're all friends that got into this, and I continued filming them for up, you know, many years. Right. And it was only once we started putting the film together they that they eventually, you know, signed the release forms, and the business end of it came in. Um, these guys were my best friends throughout high school. There have been stern words from all of them to me at points. Many of many times I've kind of taken that on board and made editorial decisions for the better. And sometimes I've stuck to my guns for the greater good of the film. Um, each and every one of them have had a different response and are mentally at different places with this film getting a public life. All right. Now, what elements in making a documentary are similar to making a feature film? I have suggestions, but I want you to volunteer some first. Um, it's a grind. Right. Definitely. I, or I guess in terms of the elements in the film. In terms of character arcs. Yeah, okay, that's a good point. I mean, this follows a pretty traditional three-act story, and uh, we chronologically grow with the characters. So I wasn't somebody that was inspired by documentaries. I was more so into Richard Linklater and Kevin Smith movies. Right. Wanted to tell, like, a coming-of-age bromance. It's just you work to your weaknesses, and I'm not a script writer. Mm -hmm. So I set out to, to make a, a film, that a documentary that felt more like a film you'd see in the cinemas. Um, so we grow with the characters. I mean, at the, the start, we're all given this awesome kind of opportunity. Um, when we get back, there's kind of the decisions as to how will, people will take different opportunities and respond to them will dictate kind of their, their future, what, what ends up happening to them. So um, I think there's definitely very strong character arcs with all of the main characters of the film. Um, we do go on a three act kind of story and by the end of it, you know, there's definitely a lot of conflict and resolution that we've experienced as a, as an audience and growth. But when you come across a character like Dave Kavanagh, who is a Londoner with a very rock and roll attitude who wants to put oomph and pizzazz into their attitude and tells them that rock and roll is hard work and that you've got to get out there and you've got to do it and you've got to work through the pain and, and all the rest of it. When you come across a character like that, do you just sort of look up? to what I refer to as the documentary God and say, thank you. <laughs> Look, Dave, Dave is one of the greatest rock and roll characters you'll ever meet. Somebody saw this film and they said to me, look, if this was a script, you could not have cast it better. And, and Dave Kavanagh is at the helm of that. Um, look, I, I had a lot of respect for Dave. Um, some of the brilliant moments in this film certainly are a result of his shenanigans and his vision. I think he's a controversial character. I think some people will think that he's a genius and other people uh, will you know, <laughs> probably think quite the opposite. Now, one of the interesting things about films that document the rock and roll lifestyle is that while we expect to have some of our cliches overturned, more often than not, the cliches are basically confirmed. Mm -hmm. Like one of the reasons why Spinal Tap is so popular among people in the rock business is because people say, you might think it's a comedy, but actually a lot of it is very true. The lifestyle that these guys are living with, the drinking and the the uh, the indulgences and the groupies and so on, actually look like what you would picture their lives to be. Was there anything in this that surprised you about the way a rock and roll band on the road lives? It was all pretty cliche, I've got to say. It was all pretty cliche. Um, no, I, I think the thing that may surprise me is just how some of the guys probably weren't. Like, I don't think Charlie's quite as enticed by all of that. He kind of stuck to his guns and his own morals. Um, myself, I was I was right into living that life. I mean, there's there are, every indulgence that the band got up to, I'm guilty of myself and... You I know. was going to ask, did oh, you actually absolutely. share the indulgences of yeah, the band? To to the fullest. Um, 
Half your luck. Yeah, and I mean, I, I ended up, uh, I'm married now, so I ended up uh, meeting my partner kind of years after the, the USA bus tour. So I, mm-hmm. I certainly indulged in everything that was on offer. And, uh, and I somewhat incriminate myself in the film as well. Now, with Will Stoker, who originally starts out as a roadie in the band and then ends up basically becoming a rival uh, musical act, uh, was there a point where you thought, you know, I, I think I might have followed the wrong guy here? <laughs> um, no, I was just happy to be following both of them, to be honest, because I love the contrast between them. I mean, yeah, Will starts off as a, as a roadie. The way we met Will was he uh, was cast in the lead role of a Ramones musical Dave was producing. Um, he was a pretty meek character when he was on tour. He was a terrible roadie and he just, uh, he was a daydreamer. He had dreams of being in a band himself. And when we got back, I remained pretty good friends with Will. And I, when I heard his early demos, I was amazed. I was like, man, this guy has a real knack for songwriting. So um, Will's one of my best friends these days, and he's been brilliant in the process of editing this film. Um, he's a true artist. And were you aware that you were actually documenting, if you like, a history of the evolution of digital technology throughout that decade? Because you start out, there are mentions of MySpace, and you have these clunky little digital cameras. Um, and then by, by the end of it, things look quite kind of different. I mean, can you just tell me a bit about that? Sure. Well, for starters, this film shot over eight different cameras. Okay. Um, but let me tell you one of the most profound moments of editing this film. About seven years after the USA bus tour, um, I was going through the gig at, that we did at the Stone Pony, and this girl comes up to Benny in New Jersey, and she's like, you guys are great. Are you on MySpace? And Benny's like, nah, don't know what that is. Oh, it's this great new thing. All the bands are doing it. And I was like, oh, that is the end of an era right there. And that was, that was when I realized how significant the time period in which we're making this film was mm. because we're of that generation where, you know, Dave's Kavanaugh's vision was you get out there, you play gigs hard and the record company people will discover you, give you a deal and that's how you make it. And then all of a sudden, like, it's all about promoting yourself online i mean tame impala got their record deal because an a&r guy was scrolling through their myspace page the whole game changed and we're of that generation that didn't really know how to adapt to it you know younger bands it comes naturally to them but we're like uh, what is it you know there's a great line where i'm saying to the guys the way the internet is myspace and and youtube is the way to go and being like well if you do that for us and we'll do it that'd be great because we can't be stuffed um, <laughs> And that's it. And, and plus, I mean, for a lot of artists, self-promotion doesn't come easy, and it certainly didn't for the screw tops. Um, so they didn't want to be sitting there saying how great their band is and making friends with other bands, trying to network falsely to get gigs. Matt, how do you live? How do I live? How do you live? Um, You've made this feature film. Yeah. And you're hoping that it will get distribution. Um, you're making another film. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you've made some short films. Yeah, I also design skate parks as well. I, I run a business doing that. Um, Jim, I live very hand-to-mouth existence. Um, I've never managed to save any money <laughs> in the entirety of doing this, um, and I just I dedicate everything I've got to, to my convictions of making films, making public spaces, and making art. Um, I have a wife who's extremely supportive. She's my meal ticket, if you like, pun intended. Um, yeah, I, I just live a life committed to what I'm doing, and, and I believe in it. So 